Hi everyone, my name is Frank Pollard. Um, I'm a professor of neuroscience in, um, at Columbia's Zuckerman Mind, Brain, Behavior Institute. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Tessier-Levine as our next speaker. Um, he earned his first um, undergraduate degree to becoming a theme uh, for multiple undergraduate degrees and BAs at McGill University, where he majored in physics. Um, he then attended the uh, University of Oxford on a Rhodes uh, scholarship and then earned a BA in philosophy and, and, and physiology. Then obtained his PhD at um, University of College London, where he worked primarily with um, uh, David Atwell on the biophysical properties of photoreceptors. Um, he then did his postdoc at Columbia University, uh, working with Tom Jessel and, and Jane Dodd on the characterization of um, the function of the floor plate in the developing spinal cord. Um, and uh, his work in, in, uh, with Tom and Jane demonstrated that this ventral structure in, in the developing spinal cord contained uh, powerful chemoattractants uh, that guided the, the commissural axons ventrally. Uh, however, by the end of his postdoc, the identity of those um, uh, molecular cues, basically, that guided those axons were, were still unknown. And in 1991, he started his own group at UCSF, where he continued to use the, the developing spinal cord as a model, and identified in a series of um, seminal papers um, the, the first um, axon guidance cues described in uh, men in CNS that he named um, Netrins. Um, following this major discovery, Mark's work um, uh, led to an entire new field of investigations uh, focusing on axon guidance, deciphering the molecular logic, um, logic that underlies these initial steps of um, circuit formation. Um, in 2001, he moved to Stanford for a couple of years, and then um, he joined Genentech in 2003 um, as the executive vice president for research and the chief scientific officer. In 2011, he became um, president of Rockefeller University, and in 2016, returned to California to become uh, the president of uh, Stanford University. Mark is a member of the National Academy of Science. Um, he's, he's a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science um, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada um, and the Ro Royal Society and Academy for Medical Science in, in the UK. Mark has received prestigious awards uh, for his pioneering work, but amazingly to me at least, he still finds time um, to, and the, the time and energy to maintain uh, a very active uh, research lab, um, continuing to work on, on axon guidance and regeneration. And so um, please join me and welcome Mark for his presentation entitled, Wiring and Rewiring the Brain, Mechanisms of Axon Guidance and Plasticity. Mark. Well, thank you so much, Frank, for that uh, very kind introduction. I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful symposium. I'd also like uh, to congratulate uh, the directors, Eric, uh, Richard, and Rui, uh, for uh, creating this extraordinary institute. I'd also like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude. Uh, so, uh, several decades ago, as you've heard, I had the great good fortune of uh, performing my postdoctoral work here at Columbia. Uh, with Tom and Jane, and I benefited not only from their mentorship, but also from that of the many other members of the uh, neuroscience community here, many of whom are still here and present uh, today. This had a transformative effect on my scientific outlook and on my scientific career, and I could not be more grateful. So today I'd like to tell you about our work on the wiring and rewiring of the brain. Uh, and we've heard about this from some of the previous speakers. Today, this starts, as you know, when neurons differentiate and extend axons and dendrites that are guided to their targets. They branch, they'll form connections with appropriate target cells. This is the generative phase of nervous system development. Then there's a regressive phase during which uh, many of the branches that are formed will be pruned back in a degenerative process, and many neurons uh, degenerate as well, thereby sculpting the final pattern of connections uh, that must be maintained in the adult. We, as you've heard, we've been interested in some of these early events of axon growth, guidance, and branching. Over the past decade, we've also become a very interested in the process of axon pruning and degeneration. But today, in the interest of time, I'm only gonna be focusing on the second topic. We became interested in this in the embryo to understand embryonic development, but of course, the ramifications are greater than that since axon degeneration occurs following injury in the adult and also in neurodegenerative 
um, disease. So what we learn in the embryo has implications for adult uh, disease states. Uh, but today I'm gonna focus uh, just on the embryo uh, in terms of degeneration mechanisms. I will, towards the end of my talk, however, turn to the adult to tell you about some more recent work that we've been doing to study axonal plasticity, the sprouting and retraction of axons that occurs in the adult in an experience-dependent manner. This is something we've become interested in, but it's turned out to be quite difficult to study, and what I'd like to describe is an approach that we've developed to facilitate this analysis, as well as some preliminary data. But most of my talk will be on degeneration mechanisms in the embryo, and I'm gonna focus on one major mechanism of degeneration in the embryo, which is degeneration of axons that occurs from loss of trophic support molecules like nerve growth factor. So a good example is provided by the track A uh, positive sensory axons in the dorsal root ganglia that flank the spinal cord. They send their axons to their targets. There they be become dependent for their continued survival on limiting amounts of nerve growth factor. Those that get enough survive, those that don't degenerate. And we can model this dependence in vitro by placing neurons in culture with NGF. If we deprive them, the axons will degenerate. At a cellular level, this degeneration has the features of apoptotic cell death, the blebbing uh, and fragmentation that's seen there. And sure enough, over the past decade, we and others have shown that this degeneration involves a classical intrinsic apoptotic pathway, which, as you know, starts at its apex with the activation of BACs and BAC uh, in my on mitochondria, the release of cytochrome C, which together with APAF1 leads to activation of the upstream caspase, caspase 9, which in turn will cleave the effector caspase, caspase 3, that then triggers uh, degeneration. And you can uh, see this uh, dependence on uh, degeneration of degeneration on caspase 3 or other components in knockout experiments like this, where uh, the degeneration we see following trophic deprivation is blocked if we use neurons from caspase 3 knockout animals. So today I'd like to focus on two aspects of this pathway. First, I'd like to uh, describe our studies on the activation of BACs and BAC following trophic deprivation. And this has led us to identify um, an unexpected role for the cell body in controlling axon degeneration in the distal axon. And I'd also like to describe some more recent uh, work that we've done that's identified a role for the tumor suppressor P53 in this process, but apparently in a non-canonical guise. Then I'd like to turn to um, events occurring downstream of ca caspase 3. Sorry. Oh, this is, let me go back here. Right here. Wrong one. There we go. Uh, downstream of caspase 3. Uh, this is because uh, activation of caspase 3 does not necessarily lead to degeneration. In some settings, uh, it can lead to um, physiological effects without degeneration. Uh, for example, Morgan Sheng and his colleagues have shown that activated caspase 3 is involved in long-term depression without morphological degeneration. So this has got us interested, of course, in uh, what controls the decision whether to degenerate or not to degenerate in response to caspase 3. Um, and uh, I'd like to tell you about our identification of a novel effector uh, that operates here that appears to be required for degeneration. So let's start with the activation of the pathway. When we started this work, we and others assumed that local deprivation of NGF would cause locally to the, uh, uh, the local activation of the BAX cas uh, caspase cascade. But what I'd like to convince you of is that, in fact, that is not what happens, that there's no direct link between this receptor and that cascade, and instead a signal has to be sent back to the cell body, which then instructs the activation of the, path the pathway. We discovered this unexpected role of the cell body in our studies of the mechanisms activating BAX and BAC. There are two well-known uh, families of regulator of these proteins. There are inhibitors, uh, anti-apoptotic molecules of the BCL2 family, um, and an opponent set of proteins, uh, which are pro-apoptotic molecules of the BH3-only uh, family. Since we were interested in the activation of BAX and BAC, we started with these factors. We found that several are not expressed by sentry neurons, Three of them, BAD, BIM, and BID, turn out not to be involved since single mutants of each or a triple knockout of uh, all three does not affect degeneration, which left one major candidate, PUMA, which turns out indeed to be key. Uh, as we can see here, that following trophic deprivation, the degeneration that's seen is blocked when PUMA is removed. And here's a quantification of that protection by PUMA. This is seen both in cultures like this, where both the axons and the cell bodies of the neurons are deprived of NGF. 
It's also seen if we just deprive them locally, which we can do in microfluidic chambers, uh, so-called Campano chambers, where the cell bodies are placed in the central compartment. This is now with NGF in all compartments. The axons will grow out. And once the cultures are established, we can deprive the axons locally of NGF in one compartment, leading to degeneration uh, that is blocked again if we take away Puma. So, so far, so good. Puma is required in the cell body and in the axon for degeneration. The surprise came when we looked where, to see where Puma is expressed. We couldn't do this by immunohistochemistry. There are no good antibodies. So we developed a method where we could separate out axons and cell bodies. We can punch out the cell bodies. And you can see that the axonal prep that remains is devoid of nuclear markers. This enables us uh, to look in the cell body and axonal compartment at the activation of caspase 3, the appearance of this band at 15, 20, and 25 hours after trophic deprivation. And you can see that this activation in both the cell bodies and the axons is blocked in, uh, if we remove Puma. The surprise is that although Puma is present in cell bodies and upregulated after trophic deprivation, we could not find it in the axons. We worried that the antibody might not be sufficiently sensitive, so we used a very sensitive mass spec approach, but found, again, that although we could see spectral matches for Puma in the cell body, with or without NGF, we couldn't detect them in the axon, even though when we looked at a control protein of similar abundance and size, we could find spectral matches in both compartments. So Puma is required in both compartments, but it's present only in the cell body, suggesting an important role for the cell body uh, in controlling axon degeneration. And Dave Simon, uh, uh, the postdoc, and Jason Pitts, the graduate student who are doing this work, wondered if they could find more direct evidence for an involvement of the cell body, and they conceived a very simple experiment shown here of culturing the neurons, then cutting them, and only after cutting them, depriving them of nerve growth factor. Here you see the cut axons, those that are uncut, and uh, when nerve growth factor is removed, those that remain tethered to their cell bodies will activate caspase 3, as you can see here, but those that have been disconnected show no caspase 3 activation. So activation of caspase 3 requires a link to the cell body. Uh, you could imagine two models for this. You could imagine a permissive model in which the cell body is continually spewing out apoptotic machinery. In the absence of the cell body, the machinery is not present. Alternatively, you could imagine a permissive model in which um, the, cell, the apoptotic, apoptotic machinery is present, but what is lacking is a signal from the cell body to activate it. And we could distinguish between these possibilities, taking advantage of a small molecule called ABT737, which is a cell permeable activator of the caspase cascade. It's actually a bad mimetic, a proapoptotic bad mimetic. So the experiment is the same. We cut the axons, but now we leave NGF present but we add the small molecule to see if it will activate caspase 3 in both the uncut as well as the cut axons. And the answer is yes. It activates in both compartments, so the machinery is present. It just can't be activated if the axons are disconnected from their cell bodies. So this supports a model in which deprivation of NGF triggers a retrograde activation of a somatic checkpoint, which then activates an retrograde progenerative signal and the caspase cascade. Now, we made some progress in identifying the components of this pathway um, in terms, and I'll just summarize this in the interests of time, that retrograde activation involves deactivation of pro-survival AKT and activation of a specific MAP kinase pathway, leading to activation of two proapoptotic transcription factors, FOXO3A and CJUN, which upregulate PUMA, which in turn then will trigger the pathway. So, of course, we're interested in the components of this anterograde signal uh, and wonder what it might be. Um, and I'd like to spend just a few minutes telling you about one factor that we've identified that we place roughly here, um, and which is uh, the tumor suppressor P53. Now, I just told you that Puma is regulated in these neurons by FOXO3 and CJUN. These were not our first candidates for transcriptional regulators of Puma. Our first candidate was actually P53 because PUMA is actually an acronym. It stands for P53 upregulated modulator of apoptosis. P53, of course, is one of the most famous transcription factors that plays a key role in regulating cell death in epithelial cells. Uh, and PUMA is a classic P53 responsive gene. So our first hypothesis was that P53 would be regulating PUMA. And in fact, we were tantalized when we found that if we look at neurons from P53 knockout animals, the axons are actually protected. So this seemed to be true, but uh, su superficially, but then the story fo started falling apart, although P53 is required 
It does not appear to have this function here. First, if we look at caspase activation, again, down in the cell body and axonal compartments, um, following a trophic factor withdrawal, you can see that if we use neurons from uh, P53 knockout animals, it's blocked in axons, but not in the cell bodies. If you think about it, this means that P53 can't be upstream of Puma, and indeed, if we look directly at Puma expression, its upregulation following trophic deprivation is uh, not affected by removal of P53. So in short, our initial hypothesis was that P53 would function as a regulator of Puma. That seems not to be the case. So there are two other possibilities. One is perhaps it's um, affecting the uh, transcription of other genes. Um, but the other possibility we want to consider is that perhaps it would function in the cytoplasm in a non-transcriptional role. Now this might seem uh, bizarre, uh, except that a precedent for this had been obtained. And in fact, P53 has been shown, at least in cell culture systems, um, to uh, be able to interact directly with BACs uh, in uh, the cytoplasm. Um, and in fact, a crystal structure of the interface has been uh, described. Now, we've been, uh, we've been intri in intrigued in by this possibility, and we've been studying it um, uh, in collaboration with Laura Tardy, our colleague at Stanford, who's generated a series of uh, mutant mice in which she's made point mutations in different domains. Um, uh, uh, one complexity is that the transactivation domain and the Bax interaction domain are overlapping, so simple point mutations here can't distinguish between the two. Uh, we've been studying all of these mice. I'll show you some data from this one here, where the transactivation domain is uh, replaced with a heterologous transactivation domain. This rescues the transcriptional activity of P53 in cancer cells, um, although it um, uh, is predicted to interfere with the Bax interaction. And although it rescues the transcriptional activation, it does not rescue the degeneration that's seen um, uh, uh, in wild-type animals. So this uh, speaks against a transcriptional role and in favor of a non-transcriptional role. Another piece of evidence is if we look just at the P53 protein in the neurons directly, it has this diffuse expression here. Uh, we can uh, cause a classic P53 response by adding doxorubicin, a DNA damaging agent. We see accumulation of P53 and, uh, in the, the nucleus. Trophic deprivation does not have that effect at all, so this is not a classical response. Again, potentially consistent with a cytoplasmic uh, role. So while the jury is still out, I would say that our working model is that P53 may function um, uh, in a non-canonical role here, that it would be, uh, that would light the fuse um, of the caspase cascade in the system. I want to turn now to what happens uh, downstream of a caspase 3. We've been interested in identifying downstream effectors. And uh, the way we uh, uh, approached this was by seeking inspiration from other non-neural systems where in the case of some caspases, not caspase 3, um, some of the effectors of those caspases are actually cleavage substrates of the caspases themselves. So we decided to look for cleavage substrates of caspase 3 in axons in degeneration and ask whether any of them are involved in degeneration. The approach we took is one that was devised by Jim Wells at UCSF that relies on the observation that cleavage of proteins by caspase 3 exposes uh, 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 de novo peptides and, and termini. And uh, using an enzyme developed, engineered by, by Jim, it's possible to ligate those N termini, a biotin affinity tag. We can observe the appearance of de novo peptides in axon and cell bodies following trophic deprivation at various hours. Here you see additional bands. Nick Hertz, the postdoc in the lab who adapted this system, was able to get it to work uh, with the small quantities of proteins we find in axons um, and um, cell bodies. Uh, and couple that with mass spec to identify de novo peptides. This led him to identify 30 putative caspase cleavage um, uh, targets that appear reproducibly in these cultures. And he tested them by CRISPR Cas9 knockout in our sensory neuron cultures using Bax knockout as a, um, a positive control. And you can see that one of them protected the axons almost as well as Bax, and that is uh, RUFY3, which encodes a protein that is relatively undistinguished. Uh, it has a run domain and a coiled coil domain. Now this protection seen with CRISPR-Cas9 knockouts was also observed when we used a germline mutant. Again, here looking at the degeneration of the axons following trophic deprivation, you can see if we use neurons from RUFI3 knockout animals that this degeneration is blocked. And here you see um, a quantification of this. 
Now, REFY3 is largely neuronal, um, uh, largely restricted to neurons. Uh, we can see this if we look in databases at the expression in adult tissues. You see this enrichment in brain areas. We can see it by in situ hybridization in uh, neurons. And if we, if we look by immunohistochemistry in um, uh, the embryo, we see expression in both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, including in dorsal root ganglia, and not just in the track A positive neurons, but also in other sensory neurons as well. Now, importantly, um, although REF43 knockout will protect the axons from degeneration, it does not block caspase 3 activation. Here you see the degeneration of wild-type neurons after trophic deprivation and the appearance of caspase 3. Here you see the protection of REF43 knockout neurons, yet by IHC you see caspase 3 activation. We also see this by Western blot here using a knockdown approach, which also protects the axons. You can see the appearance of cleaved caspase 3. And importantly, this cleave caspase 3 is active because if we look at known substrates of caspase 3, including um, beta actin and alpha spectrin, we can see the expected cleavage fragments appear. So although caspase 3 is active, it is not triggering degeneration. So uh, RUFI3 appears to uh, function at this junction here and be required for the effect of uh, activating caspase 3 to result in degeneration in these neurons. And interestingly, this appears to be regulated by phosphorylation. By mass spec again, we found that um, uh, REFY3 is phosphorylated on a particular serine residue um, in the presence of trophic factor, that after trophic deprivation, it gets dephosphorylated. Of course, the knockout protects. We believe this dephosphorylation is actually important because if we engineer a dephospho um, mimic, uh, the S34A mutant, we find that that can uh, support degeneration, just like the dephospho form here. Whereas if we engineer a phosphomimetic, the S34D mutant, we find that it blocks degeneration. So this provides an opportunity for local control of the decision whether to degenerate or not in these neurons. So in summary then, um, uh, uh, evidence implicating P53, and again, the jury is still out as to where it functions, although our working model is that it functions here and then a, a novel player, RUFY3, functioning downstream of caspase 3 and degeneration. But I want to step back and ask the question, why would you organize things this way? Why the heck would you want distal axon degeneration to be controlled by the cell body? Of course, we don't know, but we can speculate that if it could be controlled entirely locally, then if there were a transient fluctuation in NGF, that could lead to a breakage of the axon, which would be very deleterious. So perhaps it makes sense that the cell body would integrate pro-degenerative and pro-survival signals, and only when it reaches a certain threshold, then to orchestrate degeneration in a more concerted way. But again, future studies are required to determine if that's the case. Now, that's all I want to say about degeneration. Um, in the last part of my talk, I'd like to turn to the adult and again, focus on axonal sprouting and branching, the plasticity um, that occur in an experience-dependent manner there. Uh, we become interested in this, both to understand adult plasticity and also in the belief that if we could understand the mechanisms of long-range uh, axonal plas plasticity in the adult and harness them, this might be useful uh, for um, uh, ailments in which uh, axons are impaired, for example, in stroke and other diseases. Now, experience-dependent plasticity, of course, has been extremely well documented in development and early postnatal life. It was discovered by Torsten Wiesel and David Hubel in their classical studies of ocular dominance columns, where they showed that if an eye is put at a competitive disadvantage, that the amount of uh, cortex devoted to that eye shrinks and that of the active eye expands, with massive axonal rearrangements occurring during that process. They showed also, and we all learned this um, uh, it, uh, as young neuroscientists, that this only occurs during a critical period. Beyond the critical period, these massive rearrangements are not seen. And this led to the view that um, such rearrangements might not occur uh, in the adult. But that view started to evolve over the years, first with the de uh, demonstration that experience-dependent changes in receptive fields can also occur in the adult. This was first shown by uh, Michael Mersnick and his colleagues in the somato sensory system, chronic changes in um, uh, inputs can lead to changes in receptive fields. Now, this could occur at pre-existing circuits. But subsequent analysis uh, by Torsten and others in a number of systems um, has uh, shown that, in fact, axonal rearrangements can occur uh, in the adult. I'm going to focus here 
on the somatosensory system of mice, and in particular on the uh, representation of whiskers in the cortex. Uh, you all know that the major whiskers on the snout of, of rodents are represented by patches of cortex um, in, called barrels in the so-called barrel cortex. It's a three-neuron circuit to the hindbrain, from there to the thalamus, and from there to the cortex. And this is a system that has a number of advantages, including the fact that the deprivation paradigm uh, involves whisker trimming, which is both painless and also reversible. Using this system, a number of very elegant studies have been done to show axonal rearrangements. Uh, and some of the most elegant have been done here by Randy Bruno and his group. Uh, and I'll just show here, he has shown, for example, that thalamocortical axons uh, from uh, projecting to deprived barrels, uh, from uh, representing whiskers that have been deprived, uh, will actually shrink, they reduce their total axonal length uh, and the branches. And this is a reversible phenomenon. Across um, the city, Charles Gilbert um, and uh, uh, his colleagues have shown, uh, looking now at layer two, three excitatory interneurons, that uh, they will actually sprout into deprived area um, in uh, the cortex. And when we were at Rockefeller, we collaborated with Charles to study the molecular basis uh, of this. Um, and we learned a few things. First, it got us very interested in the process. But secondly, we realized just how heroic these experiments are. Um, this requires repeated two-photon imaging through a cranial window of neurons that have been pre-labeled. This involves um, uh, uh, reconstruction of neurons from sections. And in fact, in this particular experiment, uh, Randy and his colleagues injected a single neuron uh, per animal that was tested. So if we wanted to make progress in understanding the cellular and molecular basis of this, we thought we needed to um, uh, facilitate, uh, to, to develop some technologies to facilitate the analysis. So we set out to tackle four problems, being able to analyze this in volume, being able to simultaneously monitor activity to correlate with structural changes, to be able to label the neurons projecting just to a single barrel, um, and also to be able to genetically manipulate these cells in, in vivo. And in the last few minutes, I'd like to tell you about a suite of technologies that we've assembled uh, to make this possible and just show you some very preliminary data. So first, being able to label um, the, uh, these neurons in volume, we became, were inspired by the uh, brain um, clearing uh, methods that had been developed about five or six years ago. None of them suited our purpose exactly. We wanted to be able to uh, clear the brain, but be able to label um, antigens like cleave caspase three, and also maintain the morphology of the brain. Uh, we had to uh, develop our own method, uh, which we called iDisco, that checks all three of those boxes. Uh, here you see a cleared brain. And I'll just illustrate this uh, in the case of the projections from the hindbrain to the thalamus. Uh, the people who did this work were Nicolas Renier and Zhu Haou, two postdocs in the lab. And Nico subsequently, uh, with his collaborators in the Chedotal lab, um, uh, studied this projection here as a movie, um, where uh, what they've done is to label the rhombomeres uh, of origin of these neurons. And here you can see this uh, uh, projection from the hindbrain to um, the thalamus, which has been pseudo-colored in white. Um, and uh, the importance of, or the, the utility of this is that it's actually very difficult to see um, this barrel-like structure in the thalamus uh, to get it in a single plane. But of course, in volume, you can rotate things until it becomes fully in register. The next was to be able to uh, monitor activity. And like Catherine yesterday, we've used CFOS as a, um, uh, a marker of electrical activity. Uh, and again, applying iDisco, uh, we can uh, do the following type of experiment, where we shave the whiskers, leave just the C row spared. Uh, then a day later, uh, expose the animal to an enriched environment for one hour, sacrifice it, and do whole brain CFOS labeling. Uh, here CFOS is shown in red. Um, and uh, we've also collaborated with Christoph Kirst, a, a physics fellow at Rockefeller, who uh, developed software to automatically extract, uh, identify the CFOS positive cells. That's shown in green. So in red, you see the actual data. The green dots, which hopefully you can see at the center of the cells, is, are the detected cell centers uh, using that software. We're going to zoom out and just look at the, um, uh, uh, the detected cells. Now, in a separate channel, we can visualize some tissue autofluorescence that remains. Um, and this, that's shown here, that enables us to register the brain to the Allen Brain Atlas. We're going to zoom in now on the, the uh, barrel cortex, where you see the barrels also by autofluorescence. We're going to superimpose the detected cells uh, very lightly. Uh, a little hard to see, but I want you to focus here. That's the C row. We're going to get rid of the autofluorescence and just focus on the detected cells. 
um, and they will become more evident as we zoom out uh, to lower magnification. Now, because these uh, brains are, and here you see, um, the, these brains are um, uh, registered at the Allen Brain Atlas, we can actually average data over multiple brains. Uh, and uh, here's an example of automated extraction of layer four, averaging um, of a sea road spared uh, set of animals, three animals. We can also spare other rows, three animals here, three here, three here, or there, depending on the rows, it works very robustly. Um, and we can also do a time course. So I showed you after a day, you see this tight restriction to the C row, uh, but you can see actually, if you look at one week or five weeks later, a rebound um, that occurs uh, that I don't have time to discuss. The third thing we wanted to be able to do uh, then, uh, having been able to monitor activity um, and uh, visualize things in volume, is to label axons projecting to a single barrel. And the problem with that is there are no uh, transcription factors that will enable us to do that. Uh, but we took advantage of this tight expression of CFOS a day after trimming um, to, uh, and teamed up with Li Ching Luo, taking advantage of his trap two mice in which a conditional Cree is expressed in cells that are expressing um, CFOS so that if we introduce a um, conditional reporter into the thalamus by stereotactic injection, then this will only get activated if the cells are active and we provide tamoxifen to ac activate the Cree. So if we do this in a mouse with a single whisker or with a row of whiskers, we can permanently label the thalamocortical axons projecting to that single barrel or row of barrels. And these are actual data shown at low magnification of the labeling of axons projecting to a single barrel or row of barrels. We can then let the whiskers regrow for a number of weeks, and then we can deprive and look at the effects on axons. And I'm gonna close by showing you very recently, the Eliza uh, Adams, the, the student uh, who has done all this work, has just uh, pulled all this together and now has some initial data um, that I'd like to show you. So here you see um, uh, uh, an animal in which the zero um, thalamocortical axons were labeled at high magnification. We can look at the axons that project out to neighboring barrels. Um, and uh, in a five-week deprivation paradigm, uh, ELISA could either do no trimming, trim the B or a and A rows, the D uh, and E rows, or the C rows themselves. And without going through it in detail, what we found is that the, um, this has no effect, in fact, on these particular axons, unlike in the uh, Charles Gilbert system. But we did see a big effect within the C row itself that's shown here. Here, without trimming, you see the intensity here you see if the C row is trimmed, the intensity is much reduced, both in layer four as well as in deeper layers. Here's a quantification, and importantly, this reflects a reduction in total axonal arbor because the intensity per axon is not changed. This compares things between animals. We can also do an intra-animal comparison by labeling up four different barrels and then depriving these three rows, and you can see the same effect that there's a reduction in the intensity in the barrels compared to the um, intact uh, barrels here. And again, no change in intensity. So we therefore have assembled the different components. The system is uh, going to be quite useful for genetic manipulation through um, the uh, delivery of both guide RNAs or transgenes. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, we are now, we feel positioned to begin to address the cellular logic of axon pruning and sprouting in the barrel system um, using the tools that are shown here, and also to examine the molecular mechanisms, asking whether the pruning involves this caspase pathway or other pathways that I've described, and also whether the sprouting mechanisms involve mechanisms from development that get reutilized in the adult. So in closing, I'd like to thank the members of my lab. I, I mentioned the work of Eliza uh, Adams uh, on the, um, uh, the barrel system. Nick Hertz uh, discovered RUFI3. Uh, Dave Simon has done all the work on P53, uh, as well as on the cell body, and our collaborators as well. And if that, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Fantastic, so questions? Mark, any, um, any hint that the, all the pathways that you described in injury, following injury are also involved in, in pruning? I mean, 
in, in naturally occurring, occurring developmental pruning? So the, the pruning, uh, the injury pathways like the SARM pathway are you referring to? Yeah, so there, there's another major pathway, biochemical pathway of axon degeneration I didn't have time to talk about, which is the one that's activated by uh, uh, cutting an axon, so Wallerian degeneration, which is caspase independent and involves um, a protein called SARM. So we're actually um, set up now to look at both the caspase pathway as well as the SARM pathway uh, in, in these animals, and we should have the results in the next few months. Uh, <clears throat> regarding the first part uh, with the usage of the cell body to instruct neurodegeneration, yes. is it possible that the cell body is used as integrator of other signals, developmental cues that maybe also regulate whether neurodegeneration happens when uh, certain signals appear or disappear? Yeah, absolutely. At the most general level, we know that this uh, dependence of the, the neurons uh, on trophic factor for uh, continued survival, again, there's a critical period for this. Over time, the neurons will become increasingly independent uh, uh, of this. So the cell body, there must be some kind of developmental program in the, the cell body that will set the threshold. So the short answer is yes, the cell body is probably regulating things at a more global level. Um, and, uh, and again, both pro-degenerative and um, pro-survival signals may be integrated there. Steve? So Mark, when you were looking at the, the role of NGF and uh, its deprivation and degeneration, is there any evidence that if you have a neuron that branches and has two, the axon splits and goes to two different locations. If you deprive one branch of NGF, yep. what happens to the other? So that specific um, experiment with NGF has not been done, but um, what we do know is that in vivo, there are neurons that will split and where one branch is just pruned back to, to one site. Um, there's uh, some nice um, work by uh, Yutaka Yoshida, another graduate of this institution, showing that um, uh, that, that can also be caspase dependent, raising the interesting question of how you confine the effect to that branch and not the others. There are you know, some candidates for this. There are so-called inhibitor of apoptosis, the IAP proteins that could play a role, and there's some data to support that. So it, it raises, it certainly is an interesting uh, and important issue of specificity of the, the degenerative process. Yeah, and that sort of, it, it's, it's similar to what Kelsey Martin found when she was here with Eric, mm -hmm. where they found um, that there was branch-specific lo um, long-term facilitation exactly. that you could get that involved the nucleus. So. Yeah, it's the same conundrum, right? How do you make sure you confine the effect to the, the branch you want to affect? Now we have one up there, and then let us No? Oh, okay. So, right here and Leslie. One thing. For your experiments on the barrel cortex, have you looked in the brain stem to see if you have some projections into the missing fields? Because I know Mike Merzenich, when he cut the median nerve, he uncovered you know, four hours later, inputs from the back of the hand, yeah. just the different. We, we have not actually, uh, we've not looked in the brainstem yet. I mean, over, over time, we hope to look at all components of the pathway, but we're focusing our efforts initially on, on the thalamocortical projections. Yeah. We'd also like to look at the interneurons within the cortex, too. Okay. Yeah. The, the strategy of asking the nucleus if it's okay to um, kill the axon is really interesting. So, um, but would there be a system where you have a cell like a motor neuron that has an enormously long, where, where you would just not wait to tell the nucleus? Is there, is there an effect on the, the length, the, the architecture? Uh, that's a neuron? great question. I would assume naively that there would be. In fact, I assume naively that all the action would be local. When we started these experiments, this was not for us the expected um, result. Uh, I think the longest axons, again, um, that have been looked at so far are the corticospinal axons that Yutaka ha has studied and where uh, he hasn't done it directly, but I would say the weight of evidence from his study suggests a similar um, cellular cell body control. Those are the longest um, ones that have been looked at. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark.